Hey, how's it going everyone? It's Blake here from ChessPathways.com and in today's video we're going to talk about how to turn the tide of a chess game that's moving against you and fight back against your opponent. So we're going to use a very interesting training game that I actually just played against one of my students to explain this lesson. So in this game I had the white pieces, my student had black. Uh, e4, e5, you go ahead and get an Italian game here and I opt for the Evans Gambit with b4. If you're curious about this opening, they have a video on it. Just search for Evans Gambit Chess Pathways on YouTube. It's there. Um, after this video, of course, you don't mess up the algorithm. <laughs> um, but in this game, Black did not accept the Gambit. Black played Bishop B6. They played A4, A6, C3. I believe Knight C3 is a move here as well. I just played C3 to kind of stabilize the pawn. So C3, I defend the pawn. D6. Uh, both of us played the opening very well here. So Castles, Knight F6, D3, H6. Uh, pretty common in a lot of these e4, e5 openings to play h6 if the bishop is so far from home, because otherwise bishop g5 can be annoying. I often get on my students for playing these moves too early, but here black's development is pretty good. I think it's uh, it's worth considering here just playing h6. So h6, I play knight b to d2, castles, bishop b3, I just want to bring this knight to the c4 square, rook e8. Um, by the way, I think also here black could consider here playing d5. Always good to look for those central pawn breaks. Um, I'm not saying it's necessarily better than rook e8. I think rook e8 has a lot of merit too, but I think d5 is possible here. Black has two defenders, right? I have two attackers. So it is safe, and I'm not entirely sure how I would handle it. Um, I was trying to calculate lines like, what if I just take, and then I can play knight c4 at some moment, and I'm threatening to double your pawns really awkwardly, and e5 is hanging. But I don't know, because c3 is here, hanging here as well, and there's knight f4 ideas in some cases. Um, I think this is definitely worth considering for black, and I probably can't get away with knight c4 so early here. I have to do something about this. Um, so definitely worth considering to play d5. But okay, in the game, black played rook e8, knight c4, bishop a7, b5. Um, and here, black simply retreated the knight, which is fine. Um, there's actually an interesting tactical opportunity here for black. Go ahead and pause the video and think about uh, what it might be and if you would play it or not. Okay, if you're back with me. So, Block has a chance here to play a takes b5, a takes b5, and now bishop takes f2, and win two pawns and a rook for two pieces, right? If you calculate out the full line, uh, Black wins a pawn, I win a piece, you win a rook, I win a piece, you win another pawn, right? Um, is this good or bad? Very hard to say. By point count, it's good for Black, right? Black wins kind of seven points for six, Right? A rook and two pawns, that's seven, versus two pieces, that's six. Um, but of course, when the material is imbalanced, it's very hard to evaluate, and it comes down to which kind of pieces are better here. You know, maybe it's not so easy to claim the two rooks against one are so great here, because the rooks are kind of discoordinated, and my minor pieces do seem very, very active in this position. So, uh, who knows, but definitely worth considering. Um, I think it's also fine not to go for the tactic. The important thing is that you're always keeping an eye out for these things, and that you see it and then trust your evaluation from there. But in the game, black did not go for it. Black played knight b8. I played bishop e3. We trade. I play knight takes e3. Takes, 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 bishop e6. So far, I think both players have played perfectly. I was pretty proud of my student that he played the opening so well here, despite not really being familiar with the Evans Gambit. And we arrive at this pretty balanced position here on move 17. So here I play bishop takes e6. And here I think black played the first inaccuracy of the game. So think about how you would recapture here with black. Would you play f takes or rook takes? Pause your video and think about it. All right, if you're back with me. So this is actually a case where I'm pretty sure black has to play f takes. Um, a lot of players are scared of the double pawns. And when I, when I talked to my student after the game, he said he wanted to avoid the double pawns. But here, the double pawns don't seem weak at all. And the pawn on e6 actually does a great job restricting the knights. And whenever you're playing these, you know, no bishop, double knight kind of middle games, it's all about the knights and the outposts and the important squares for the knights. So I think f takes is a great move here. I can't really win this pawn, right? And it just covers all the squares. In the game after rook takes, I feel like black would not want to trade light squared bishops if you can't play f takes. Because now I just have two really nice juicy squares for the knights, right, on d5 and f5. Neither one is strictly an outpost because black has ways to fight back. Um, but those ways aren't so easy to implement in practice, so I was kind of happy to see this. Plus, the rook is kind of awkward on e6. So, I played queen a7, making use of my open a file. b6, c4. And again, in these double knight middle games, it's really all about outposts, right? Black has some nice squares here for their knights. c5, d4, f4, maybe going after my d3 pawn, which is kind of the, 
the thing that holds the entire pawn chain together. And I want to do the same thing, right? Bring knights to squares like d5 or f5 or c6 or a6, all these nice little outposts or pseudo outposts, and possibly try to target the c7 pawn, which is holding all of black's pawn chain together. So pretty interesting fight ahead. Black played knight b to d7, great move, trying to activate that knight, hopping to some of these outposts. Rook a1, rook e8. And now think about what you would play here with white. Again, go ahead and pause the video and come up with a plan. There might be more than one right answer. All right, if you're back with me, again, I'm not saying there's just one correct plan here. There's no immediate tactic, so multiple possibilities are on the table. Um, if you have a different idea than me, I'm not saying it's uh, you know necessarily wrong. You can go ahead and test it against a computer, play some training games. But I like to think about what's my worst place piece when I have trouble coming up with a plan, right? Which piece should be improved? And here I think it's definitely the f3 knight, right? This knight is kind of useless on f3. There's nothing it's doing here, right? So I come up with a plan to improve this knight and try to use it to get to one of these outposts. So I played knight e1. Uh, my idea here was knight c2, knight b4, knight c6, or d5, or a6, <laughs> kind of defending. Um, plus it's nice that on c2 it also watches over d4. And it's also out of the way of rook a3, which I might need to defend my d pawn. Again, kind of the most important pawn of this pawn chain in case black plays knight c5. So that was my plan. Black did play knight c5. I play rook a3 to free up this knight from defensive duty. Uh, and now knight h5. So black's trying to get something going. I think they certainly can't be faulted for this, but I was a little bit happy to see this knight leave the f6 square because now knight d5 is on the table without having to offer a trade. So I first just restrict this knight, g3, right? Don't allow it into f4. G6, knight C2, again, implementing my idea here, knight E6, watching over C7 possibly, maybe even hopping to D4 at some moment. Um, now I choose to play knight D5 first, going after uh, C7. And now we'll flip this around, do it from black's perspective. What do you think's going on here with black, and what would you play? Go ahead and pause the video, try to think for at least 30 to 60 seconds here, and come up with a plan for black, and come up with what move you would play here with black. All right, if you're back with me, so up to this point, it had been a very hard-fought game, both sides trying to implement their ideas, and Black is far from out of this fight, right? Black is definitely in this game. But it has kind of become apparent, at least to me, that if this becomes a purely positional struggle about outposts and weak pawns, White's going to win that battle, right? Think about it. I can play moves like Knight B4, Knight A6 or something. C7 is very weak. It's very hard to move it because uh, B6 is weak. So Black would love to turn the tides here. And it's very interesting because when you study classic chess games like Capablanca and Lasker, you know, games from, from 100 years ago, Rubenstein, um, very often you see a player get to implement their positional idea from start to finish, right? And we teach beginners to study those games because that's very instructive to see. But in modern chess, it doesn't happen so much because as soon as someone starts to feel that they're losing that positional battle about weak pawns and stuff like that, they'll just find the first opportunity to, to, to sacrifice something if they have to, and turn the tables and start attacking the opponent's king or, or do something that changes the nature of the position. So I think here black had a perfect chance to do that and play here f5. My pieces are very far from the king. I talked to him after the game and he said he was worried about exposing his own king. But my pieces are kind of all in on the queen side for this positional fight for weak pawns and outposts, right? They're not really on the king side. So I think black should try to change the nature of this position, right? Play f5, maybe even queen g5 in a couple moves, maybe after f4, and maybe you just sacrifice the c-pawn at some point. That's possible. Let the whole queen side fall apart, right? Let me take c7 and b6 while you're playing f5, f4, queen g5. Maybe knight f4 is a sacrifice at the right moment and trying to get to this king. And I think by playing that, black really could have hung around in this game, even though it seems like white's winning this positional battle. Instead, in the game, uh, black played here queen to b8, trying to trade queens, but it turns out this really just plays into white's hands. By trading queens, you're making the game strictly a positional battle where there's no possibility of attack, right? And after simply knight c to b4, takes, takes. It turns out that in just two moves, black goes from having a very balanced chance here with f5 to being completely lost, right? Because now the pawns are indefensible. Rook c8 does not work because of knight e7, and there's simply no way to defend the c7 pawn. And after c7 falls it becomes clear more pawns are going to fall, right? Now rook c6 is unstoppable. Rook a8 is the only chance for counterplay, but knight a6 shuts that off right away. And again, rook c6 and, and more pawns fall, and black is just going to get ground down positionally with no chance uh, to escape. So I thought my student played a really good game there, and I think the biggest lesson from that game is when you're getting ground down in that positional battle, you don't have to take it all the way to the end. You should always look for a moment to sacrifice something or start an attack or change the character of the position 
and not let your opponent carry out their plan from start to finish. It's okay to sacrifice something if this is the alternative, just getting ground down positionally. All right, thanks for watching, everyone. Please make sure you visit my website, chesspathways.com, and get signed up there. It's totally free, only takes five seconds, and I will send you a free move-by-move -move guide to chess thinking when you sign up. Thanks, and I'll see you there.